Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hello. Today is the 4th of July, the 24th day of the month of Tammuz 2021. Welcome to News from the Torah. This is Leah Aharoni, and I'm so glad you chose to join us today. So first of all, for all of our American listeners, happy Independence Day. We hope you got some great meat cuts for this barbecue, and you're going to go out and enjoy the parade, the fireworks, or whatever celebrations are happening in your community today. It's certainly a terrific time to celebrate the, your independence, especially after last year. Independence Day celebrations got canceled in some places. So happy Independence Day to our American listeners. And today we're finishing, or more correctly, this week we're finishing the book of Numbers, the book of Bamidbar, the Jewish people's journey through the desert is about to be over as they're standing on the cusp of entering the promised land. And on this show today, I want to talk about our own journeys to the promised land, our journeys to our personal promised lands, our journeys towards our goals, towards our commitments, towards our life missions, the one that you really want to happen. We're going to have a whole segment that talks about the attractions and distractions on our way to our personal promised land. I also want to take the time to talk about the journey of the Jewish people to the actual promised land. Are we preventing ourselves from entering the promised land? And what are the prices we may pay for doing so based on the Torah? And finally, one more segment about the quality of Jewish unity that has to be in place for the Jewish people to enter the promised land. It was this way in the Bible when Moses was about to let the Jewish people go into the promised land before he passed away. One more thing he had to do before he passed away to enable the Jewish people to go into the land of Israel. And it's certainly true today, especially during these three weeks when we are mourning the destruction of the two temples, Jewish community, is the way to bring our Gerula, our redemption. More about all of this on this show. Stay tuned. How did a nice Jewish girl from Delaware end up living in Israel? Shalom! I'm Natalie Sapinski. Join me on my show, Returning Home. Meet different people who have moved to Israel. Hear their personal stories, their highs, their lows, and everything in between. Each week, we talk to experts on immigration and the process of moving to Israel. Listen to Returning Home every Thursday, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back. So as we said at the outset, happy Independence Day to all our American listeners, to everybody who is celebrating the 4th of July today, America's Day of Independence. And I would like to talk about the Jewish American experience for a few minutes today on this show and to ask whether the American Jewish experience is about to come to the end. In 1940, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe came to America from Europe, and people tried to convince him that America is somehow different from every other place. You can't keep kosher in America. America is different. And the Rebbe's refrain used to be, America is not different. So when people would tell him that you cannot keep kosher in America, he would say, America is not different. People would tell him that you cannot keep Shabbat in America. 
she would say, America is no different. And when people would say, you cannot have Jewish education. That's outdated. Here you have to prepare people for a secular career and you have to teach them secular studies. And who cares about Jewish education? He would say, America is no different. Now, in this week's Torah portion, we read about the 42 journeys of the Jewish people from the time the Jewish people left Egypt until the time they went into the land of Israel. They journeyed through 42 different places. Some of those journeys were terrific, authentic, empowering, like the journey to Mount Sinai where the Jewish people received the Torah. And some of those journeys were painful and tragic, like Kivrota Ta'ava, a spot where the Jewish people had a lust for meat and were killed and buried. It's literally called the burial of the lust. Now, the Hasidic masters teach that all of the journeys were by the word of God. God wanted the Jewish people to experience each journey to its fullest, to take advantage of every journey on this trail, on this path for greater growth so that a people of the slaves that left Egypt could develop on this journey to a place of becoming a free people by the time they came to the land of Israel. And that was meant to be a fairly short process. But the Jewish people got distracted with various distractions. We'll talk more about that at a later point in the show. And instead of getting to the land of Israel fast, they went on this 40-year circuit trip that was completely unplanned, uncalled for, and was certainly not the word of God. The Baal Shem Tov, the greatest teacher of Hasidut, the founder of the Hasidic movement, teaches us that every single person has these 42 journeys in their life from the time we are born until we pass on to the promised land of the world to come. We each have our 42 journeys by the word of God. God wants every one of us to take these 42 journeys of self-development. And each journey is supposed to develop us, to empower us, to open up our mind, to open up our soul to new possibilities. It's supposed to build us. Unfortunately, very often, we use these journeys to undermine ourselves. And instead of using them as growth opportunities, we get stuck in those journeys, and then they become tragedies, not moments of self-fulfillment. So just like 42 journeys happen to the Jewish people in the desert, and just like 42 journeys happen to each individual, the Jewish people for the past 2,000 years has been going through multiple journeys from one exile to another exile, from one country to another country, from one city to another city. And some of these journeys have been terrific, and some of these journeys have been tragic. Now, why are the journeys? The Tanya teaches that every person comes into the world with a certain portion of the physical world that they're meant to elevate. And how do people elevate the world? When they use the physical world with divine purpose, with divine intention in mind. For example, somebody can eat a piece of juicy steak. If they have a divine intention of eating this piece of steak to be strong, to be healthy, to have a sharp mind, or they eat it on Shabbat or on a Jewish holiday when you're supposed to have pleasure, then they use this piece of physical world with divine attention, and they're elevated. And in Judaism, we are not against the physical. We're all about using the physical to elevate it for divine purpose. But on the other hand, a person can take the same resource, the same piece of the physical world, and downgrade it by just indulging in it with no purpose at all, 
or using it for something negative. So this is part of the 42 personal journeys. In the same way, the Jewish people, by going to different countries, spending times in different exiles, have been able to take parts of all these different cultures and elevate them by incorporating them into the Jewish lifestyle and into the learning of the Torah. So for example, if you learn biology, if you learn physics, if you learn astronomy, and you take that knowledge and you integrate it into your Torah learning, you're taking that knowledge and you're elevating it by using it for divine purpose. And every single nation of the world has brought things that are special to it to this world. So by integrating all of those secular inventions, sciences, developments, practices, lifestyles, and integrating them into the Torah lifestyle, bringing them up to the divine, they're elevated. And this has been one of the purposes of these exiles, of these journeys. But what happens sometimes, just like we get stuck in one place, in one journey, the Jewish people get stuck in a certain exile. They forget that the exile is supposed to be temporary. It's not their final destination. It's just one more journey on their way to the promised land. And for the Jewish people, the promised land is the land of Israel. Sometimes Jews get too comfortable in exile, too used to it, too happy there. And they think that they have arrived home. And when that happens, unfortunately, Jewish history has shown that tragedy calls. It happened in Spain before the Spanish Inquisition. Unfortunately, it happened in Europe. And it sounds like it has happened in America again. Every day when we pray, we pray for the engathering of the exiles. And we have a line that says, Sh sound the big shofar, the big horn, to gather the exiles. And Rabbi Avram Yitzchak HaKohen Cook, the chief rabbi of Israel who passed away in mid-1930s, asks, what is this big horn? He brings a law from the laws of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, when the horn is blown, the shofar is blown, and he says that there are three types of shofar. There is the ram's horn, that's the preferable, most beautiful way to perform this commandment, and the ram's horn is the best way to do it, that's the big horn. Then there is the middle horn, the kosher horn of any kosher animal, and it can also be used, but it is not such a beautiful way of performing that commandment. And then there is the impure horn, a horn of a non-kosher animal that can be used only if there's no other choice and there's no blessing made on that horn. And he uses these three horns as symbolism for why Jews come to the land of Israel. The preferable reason that a Jew comes to the land of Israel is the beautiful big horn. It is when Jews come to Israel out of ideology, when Jews understand that this is the promised land, in which God wants us to build a perfect Jewish society. Our society is Jewish, but it is not perfect. It is far from perfect. It needs more perfection and more development. And it is the life mission of every Jew to come to the land of Israel and be part of rebuilding a perfect Jewish society that one day will be a light unto the nations. This is the mission of the Jewish people. And when people are ideologically motivated to come to the land of Israel to be part of that project, that's the big horn. The second horn is when Jews come to the land of Israel for economic reasons, where Israel is a better economic place for them to build their life. And we have seen that over the past 10 years, when many Jews moved away from their communities to Israel because there are better health benefits here because they're better educational choices and they're much cheaper in Israel. And this is the middle horn. And that's, there is the impure horn, the horn of anti-Semitism. And this horn has been raising its ugly head in America more and more over the past few years. Just on Friday, we saw a Chabad rabbi in Boston being stabbed outside of his synagogue. 
And I think the time has come for American Jewry to understand that America has been amazing. It's been the golden country for 250 years. Let's not overstay our welcome. Let's not wait for the impure horn of anti-Semitism to drive us out. Let's come to Israel now for the right reasons. Stay tuned for my messages after this as we continue our journey to the Promised Land. Shalom, everybody. Making a difference often takes just one moment and one person at a time. I am Orly Benny Davis, your show host on Israel News Talk Radios from Jerusalem with love. You'll be hearing people talking about politics, religion, social issues, and making a better tomorrow. Join me, Orly Benny Davis, for God and Country. From Jerusalem with love. Wednesdays on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back. So this week, we wrap up the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, by reading two Torah portions, Matot and Mas'e. And in this week's Torah portions, God tells Moshe to do one more thing before he dies. There is this one more war that has to be fought, and Moshe has to fight it, nobody else, and he cannot pass away without fighting this war. This is the war on the Midianites. Now, if Moshe cannot pass away without fighting this war, and if this war has to be fought specifically by Moshe, it's the concluding chapter of his life, so to speak. That means that it is critical for his life mission and for his life purpose. And what is Moshe's life mission and life purpose? It's giving the Torah. So how is giving the Torah and passing the Torah to the Jewish people connecting to fighting the Midianites? Well, we're going to discuss that right now. The fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, the Rashab, has a long discourse on this Torah portion, and it's very illuminating. He writes that the world for Midianim, Midianites, Midian, is closely related to the Hebrew word Madon, fighting. This whole entire story of the Midianites is that they represent fighting, infighting among Jews. And every single symbol and every single detail of this week's Torah portion dealing with the fighting of the Midianites relates to us finding tools and, and strategies for fighting the infighting. So one thing that's very important is that every single tribe of Israel had to put out soldiers to fight the Midianites. The entire Jewish people had to be united, present a united front to fight the Midianites. Because to create peace, to create connection, to create a united front, to create a country that is united, you need every single group in that country, every single demographic to be committed to unity. Because as soon as one part of the community or one part of the country, one demographic is not committed to unity and they want to fight their own battles and advance their own agenda, they will find ways to undermine the unity of everybody. So everybody has to be connected. Everybody has to be committed to the goal of unity. So what is the greatest danger to unity? What is the greatest danger to Jewish people being united? The Rashab has a very interesting insight. He says that the greatest cause of Madon, the greatest cause of infighting, is when people turn on each other over religious reasons. When every person decides that their way of serving God is the best, their way of serving God is the only one 
that's holy. That other people's ways of learning the Torah, serving God, praying, are somehow not as good. Now, it's very important to um, clarify that in Judaism, there are parameters, the things that are inside the field and the things that are outside the field. Judaism is not a religion where everything goes. And in fact, the certain parameters that if you cross them, you're outside of the boundaries of normative Judaism. So these two things are not a contradiction. For example, believing in one God or believing that the Torah has a divine origin or believing that every single word in the Hebrew Bible, in Tanakh, is true and is word of God or that every single mitzvah and every single commandment is binding um, that the Mashiach will come. There are certain truths that are a part of Judaism and if you deviate from the, if you believe that only one word in the Bible is not true or that one mitzvah that God gave one commandment is no longer binding, if you believe that then you have left the path of normative Judaism and have crossed over to different religion. However, within the parameters of normative Judaism, as are defined by the Talmud and by our sages, there's a lot of room for interpretation. There's a lot of room for variety of practices, the different ways to pray, the different ways to perform the different commandments, the different intentions people can have. And there is quite a variety of groups and communities with different focuses and emphasis. And that's beautiful. It's actually a whole variety. It is thought that the 12 tribes of Israel all had a specific path in the service of God. And each one of the tribes had its own prayer formula, its own formulation of prayers. Each tribe had its own approach in how to serve God. And that's beautiful. That's part of the multifaceted Judaism that we believe in because God created the entire world. And in this world, there are many approaches that can be taken. And all of these approaches have to come together to be united in the service of God. However, when people believe that their approach is the only correct one, that their rabbi is the only one who matters and is the only one who is holy. Where their interpretation of the Torah is the only one that holds. The Rabbi Rashab writes that people create their own platforms. And from those platforms, they disqualify and delegitimize other Jews. That's the greatest source of madon. That's the greatest source of infighting. Why is that? Because when you attack other people's ways of serving God, once again, within the parameters of normative Judaism, what you're really doing is defending your own insecurities. And not only that, you're delegitimizing a way of using part of God's world for serving God. And because everybody's so sure that they're doing this for holy reasons, they're doing this because God wants them, and they're so, so, so convinced that they're right. There's no talking them out of it. So this is the greatest source of division. And people can really fight it out over very, very minute things. And unfortunately, I get to see a lot of this when people with these self-righteous attitudes come across and say, oh, wait, no, the way you're doing Judaism is all wrong. And it's talking about people who are God-fearing people who are very dedicated to the service of God. But for example, there are people who believe that if you spend your life learning in Kodal, you spend your life learning in yeshiva, in a seminary where people dedicate their life to learning Torah for decades, you're somehow doing Judaism wrong because it doesn't juggle with their ideas of how Judaism should be done. And other people think vice versa. If you leave the yeshiva and you go to university and you actually have a job while well, you're doing Judaism all wrong and it's all about the peripherals it's not about the core issues it's not about you know do you believe in the divine um, origin of the Torah do you believe in every mitzvah these Jews and these Jews that practice 
the same laws, they do the same mitzvah, the same commandments, but they have different sociological um, choices or different lifestyles. And over these lifestyles, they're going to fight each other and tell each other that their Judaism is not right. And this is the greatest threat to the integrity of the Jewish community. And it's important to understand with, without unity, you cannot have proper normative Judaism. The integrity of the Torah, the integrity of the Jewish community depends on people coming together with different lifestyles and different approaches and different interpretations and creating this one beautiful whole. And this is why Moshe's work could not be completed without this community. Because we need to understand that people are very different. The Baal Shem Tov writes that what is a mitzvah, a commandment for one person, can be an advice of the evil inclination for a different person. For one person, too much frivolity is bad. And for another person who is on the verge of depression, he needs that frivolity to get himself himself out to dissipate the stress, not to fall into depression. So what's right for one person is not necessarily right for the other person. We're different people. We need different approaches. We need a whole multifaceted Judaism where every person can find himself or herself. And without that, the entire Jewish people cannot receive the Torah. There's no one path that is right in Judaism. And unfortunately, we're finding many, many young women and men leaving their communities because their communities are so single-minded that they outrule other, other types of Judaism or other types of practices. So if you're looking at other Jews who are also committed to God's word, who are also committed to halacha, to Jewish law, who are also committed to learning Torah, and you're finding something wrong with them, please understand that you are going against the way God wanted the Torah to be given. You are undermining Moshe's life mission of giving the Torah to the entire Jewish people. Before we can enter the land of Israel, we need to get rid of Madon. We need to get rid of infighting. It is especially important during this period of the three weeks as we mourn the destruction of the two temples. Stay right there. We'll be right back. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. This is Shai Bentico, and each week I'll be webcasting to you from Judea, origin of the word Jew, a people besieged and beleaguered in every generation. Nazi Germany is but a memory, but in its place the world invented the phantom Palestinians as this generation's internationally authorized Jew killers. Tune in for a different slant on life in Israel. Phantom Nation, every Monday. Hi, I'm Rabbi David Aaron. The soul basics are the most profound, the most essential, and yet often the most neglected in our education. Join me for Soul Talk on Israel's News Talk Radio and discover the secrets to love, spiritual growth, and personal power. Once again, welcome back. And as we said earlier, this week we're finishing the book of Bamidbar, the book of uh, Numbers. And after this book, we have one more book, Deuteronomy, Dvarim, which is all one long monologue by Moses before he passes away. So basically, we're done. We've been with the Jewish people from the time that God created the world all the way through leaving Egypt, 
the 40 years in the desert and we are standing on the cusp of entering the promised land. And I want to ask you, what is your promised land? What would need to happen for you to enter your own promised land? What does it look like? Where is it? And what's preventing you from getting there? For the past several weeks, throughout the book of Numbers, we've been reading about the different distractions, different things that distracted the Jewish people from going into the land of Israel. So obviously, the golden calf was a distraction, and also their own fears and the sin of the spies was a big distraction, a 40-year-long distraction. Now, this week, I heard a very interesting masterclass with a person by the name of Nir Eyal. He's a former Israeli who spent a lot of time in the Silicon Valley, and he taught marketing at Stanford University. And for the past five years or so, he has been studying the science of distraction. What is distracting us from reaching our goals? What is distracting us from entering into our own promised land? What is distracting us from becoming the best versions of ourselves? Now, I know that many of us feel like we're missing focus. We know we want to be moving in a certain direction, but there's so much stuff happening around us, and this stuff grabs at our attention. And not only are we not moving towards our promised land, but we also feel very overwhelmed. Like there's too much stuff happening. We work way too hard. And we have very little to show for that hard work because although we're working hard and we are overwhelmed, we're not moving towards our own promised land. So over the next few minutes of this segment, I want to discuss some of Eyal's ideas about what is distraction and how we can fight it back to get our time back and our focus back to actually move towards our own personal promised land. So first we need to figure out what we're trying to achieve. Now, if our issue is distraction, asks Eyal, Well, what's the opposite of distraction? And most of us think that the opposite of distraction is focus. But he has no. The opposite of distraction, if you move away the dis, is traction. What's traction? Traction is what gets you towards your purpose. It's action. Traction has the word action in it. These are actions that are moving you towards your purpose. So anytime you move towards your purpose, you are making, you're taking the actions of traction. And every time you do things that are not moving you towards your purpose, you are being in distraction. So I think this is a very important distinction and I think it's terrific because to be able to be in traction, you need to figure out where am I going and what do I want to achieve to get to my own promised land. And then you can also see what are the distractions that are keeping you away from your promised land. So he gives an interesting example. For example, you want to spend some time on social media. Is that traction or distraction? It really depends. If you've defined for yourself that you want to spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes on Facebook to catch up with your friends, then that's traction because that is something you define for yourself as a meaningful activity, part of your values. And you're spending 40 minutes on the internet, on social media to catch up with your friends. That's an act of traction. But if you're just scrolling through Facebook instead of getting to an important deadline that you need to be getting to and you're just too afraid to approach the work, then those same 40 minutes on Facebook become a distraction. Okay, so now, how do you fight distractions? He gives a whole bunch of different techniques, but I want to focus on two things that I found meaningful in his talk. Number one, he shared that although we think that most of our distractions come from external sources, 
like Facebook or mail or social media or other people or other workers or work um, needs. Like sometimes I sit down to do some work and at that very moment, somebody will email me or call me or ask me to do something urgent, a big distraction. So we usually think that what's taking away our attention, what's pulling away our attention are all these external things. And he says that research shows that all those external distractions are only 10% of our distractions. But 90% of our distractions come from within. How does that work? And here he coined a great line, which I think is very true. He writes that time management is actually pain management. We have all these internal pains, all these internal discomforts, the psychological states that we don't enjoy. And when these psychological states happen, instead of paying attention to them and working through them, we get distracted by opening our phones, going online, calling somebody, or just doing something that's distracting. So that internal discomfort can be boredom, it can be loneliness, it can be some kind of psychological pain, it can be a feeling of failure. So instead of surfing that feeling, and I will show you in a minute how to do that, we instead pull for the device to use it to distract us, not from the task, but actually from the discomfortable feeling. So what New Eyal suggests doing in such a situation is setting your timer for 10 minutes. And in those 10 minutes, either going back to the task you are planning on doing, or looking at that feeling, looking at that urge to go to the phone, to eat that cake, to do something that's really distracting for you, looking at that urge and seeing maybe it will be with it, acknowledging it and seeing how it feels. And he says very often by the time 10 minutes are over, you will be back at your task. I want to suggest a different technique. I suggest that when you feel an urge to do something that you know is not good for you, whether it is going on the phone or eating something that you know you should not be eating or saying something you know you should not be saying, or doing something you know you should not be doing, closing your eyes and looking at that urge and getting to know it, instead of running away from it, actually running towards it. We have a maxim in Judaism, an axiom, that all pain comes up to be healed. Just like your physical pain comes out to be healed, if you hand that root canal. It hurts, but it hurts to let you know that something is wrong so you can go and get that treatment and heal it. Likewise, all the psychological pain and discomfort that comes up is there to be healed. And it can only be healed when it is acknowledged. So when you feel that boredom, you feel that loneliness or that feeling of insecurity, a feeling of failure, whatever that psychological feeling is, One thing you can do is actually close your eyes and just look at it. Maybe it has a space, a place somewhere in your body. Maybe if you look at it, maybe it has a color, a texture, a shape. Look at it and acknowledge that it is coming up to be healed. It also might have a voice. So you may want to look at it and very quietly listen and hear if it has a message. What do you have to say? What do you have to share? Listen to the message, maybe it's there, and then let it dissipate. See how it dissipates, it leaves your body, leaves your psyche. And on the other side of this meditation, which takes a few minutes, you may find yourself free from the urge of doing whatever it is that you wanted to do. So I think this is a very powerful way to master our own internal triggers and internal urges. And the other thing I found very helpful in Nirial's presentation was his suggestion to get rid of the to-do lists because your to-do list only shows you that you're failing. He says that very few people finish everything on their to-do list. And after you cross some items and have some items left, 
day after day, week after week, month after month, you feel like a failure. Instead, plan your day out with all the activities you want to do, everything you want to do for yourself, for your relationships, for your work. Put it on as blocks of time on your calendar and put your to-do lists inside that calendar, inside the blocks of time, and your only measure of success is if you do what you said you would do for the time you said you would do that. I think it's a revolutionary way to look at how we plan our time on our way to our own personal promised lands, on our own personal journey towards our goals with less distractions. I'm wishing you a terrific week of no distraction and lots of traction on the way to your own promised land. And on the other side, next week, we'll be starting a new book in the books of Tara. Have a great week now. Bye-bye. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. Just click the orange button at the top of the IsraelNewsTalkRadio.home page, log in as yourself or an anonymous guest, and join in on the fun. You'll meet other listeners from all over the world who listen to Israel News Talk Radio, and you can make new friends. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. It's the closest you can get to being in the studio with us. We love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.